Well, uh, thank you everyone for coming for a morning 10.30 talk. Um, it gives me incredible pleasure. I'm super excited to introduce Stephanie Telex, who is faculty at Brown. And Stephanie does some like incredible work at the intersection of machine learning, reinforcement learning, um, robotics, human-robot interaction, grounded language, all amazing stuff. And I think we'll be here for a long time if I go through her list of awards. Um, she best student paper at SIGIR, ICMI, RSS, Blue Sky uh, Ideas Initiative. Um, she has, like it seems, a NASA Early Career Award, Sloan Research Fellowship. I mean, I'm just picking and choosing right now, and an NSF <laughs> Career Award. So um, without further ado, um, Stephanie. Awesome. Thanks very much. Um, it's nice to be back here at MSR. Uh, so this talk is called Learning Models of Language, Action, and Perception for Human-Robot Collaboration. Um, and I've done this work in collaboration with a wonderful group of students and, and colleagues at Brown University. We're out to solve AI. Um, so if you're interested, yes, we are. Um, so if you're interested in learning more about that, I'll talk a little bit about that today. Um, but come by and visit us and help us. Uh, so we're at a really exciting time in robotics. Uh, there's been a tremendous amount of progress in terms of transitioning these systems from laboratory environments and demonstrations into real world functioning things that are being commercialized or on the very edge of being commercialized and used by end users. So for example, I was part of this uh, forklift project when I was a postdoc at MIT. It's an autonomous robotic forklift that can navigate around warehouse environments and pick up pallets and put them down. Uh, today, there's been, of course, a tremendous uh, surge of interest and investment in the self-driving car uh, that was it was the outgrowth of projects like this one um, and the DARPA robotics challenge and stuff and Waymo just announced they're doing unmanned testing of their vehicles in sunny Arizona um, not rainy Boston and Providence and you know I think you could do pretty well here actually it's not it rains but not you know yeah, not a lot. The variance yeah. is not yeah, the variance is right. Um, so, so in sunny Arizona, you can actually drive in these Waymo cars, and there's no safety driver. There's no safety driver in the car. You're just in the back seat, and it's driving autonomously. Um, this technology is coming. Uh, I teach. I was telling some of you before the talk. I teach a course at Brown. Um, hey, where every student gets their own autonomous Raspberry Pi Python drone. So this is like a shot of the drone in the air. Um, they build it and then they fly it. All the software is written in Python for the course. So uh, it's like one drone per student or something. Amazon funds the drone. It would cost about $220 right now. I think I can bring that price down um, to make it even more accessible. And this is a picture of our flight day. Uh, we went to the tennis course and you know everybody's got their drones laid out. Um, they can fly on these, these highly textured planar poster boards. Um, they fly in their dorm rooms. They fly in, in like the lounge, in the, in the lobby area. They fly in our lab. We finally got a net in my lab like last week. Um, but for, you know, for all this, we didn't have a net. Uh, it's, it's pretty safe, and it's all off-the-shelf stuff. You can, you can just order it on Hobby King. Um, and my former group, my former group mates came out to, to work with Nick Roy on Project Wing which you may have heard about, that was drone delivery. Um, and then they spun out a company called Skydio. Who's heard of Skydio? Some of you? Some of you, yeah. Cool stuff, right? We just bought one. And, what's that? I saw their demo. You saw the demo in RSS. Yeah, yeah. My, my advisor was like, you, like you, you see, you've never seen as many robots jumping, roboticists jumping behind trees <laughs> when this demo. So the Skydio is a drone with uh, 13 cameras. It has a stereo pair for each of the six sides of the cube. So that's 12, because six sides. And then there's a high resolution color camera. And we were playing with it at my, uh, at my colleague's house with my little son, he's five. And it like follows him around and he's like backing it into a fence and it like pops up autonomously over the fence. You know, he's running around the yard in circles trying to lose it and it, lose it and it's following him around and around and around, dodging the trees and the railings and him and, and stuff. Um, it's a consumer drone, you can buy it. Um, we bought it. Uh, so th so these, these platforms are becoming cheaper they're becoming more reliable, uh, and they're becoming more and more available to, to people uh, in homes, in factories, in our playgrounds, in our cities. So as this technology advances, there's a real question as to how these robots are going to interact with us in our daily lives. This is my son when he was a baby, um, with the PR2 robot. Uh, uh, and there's a real question as to how are 
we going to work with them? How are we going to tell them what to do? How are they going to do things that we want and not do things that we don't want in these very complicated environments with these very powerful, capable platforms um, with very high value things that we definitely don't want them to, to hurt or make sad. Um, so existing interfaces to this technology is things like cell phones and controllers, like PlayStation controllers. So for example, for the forklift, there was a touch screen interface where you would circle where the pallet was that you wanted it to pick up, and then you would circle where you wanted it to, to go. Uh, but, and, then, and then it would go off and do that. And the thing about all these interfaces is that the user's hands and eyes are down in the interface as opposed to being out in the world where the robot is and where all the stuff that you care about is. And you're also giving fairly low-level, fine-grained commands to the robot. Um, to the point where, like, well, if I've got to do that, maybe I should just get behind the forklift and drive it myself. Um, so instead, what I'm trying to work towards is a world where we can interact with the robot as if it was another person. So for example, for the forklift, we'd like to be able to say in words what we want it to do. You might say something like, put the metal crate on the truck. And then the robot has to figure out from these words, from this symbolic expression that maybe it's extracted from speech recognition, it has to figure out what the metal crate is and where the truck is. And at the end of the day, it's got to figure out what electrical signals to send to its motors to cause the, 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 trait, the crate to be where the, the human is telling it to be. And this is challenging for a lot of reasons. So the first reason it's challenging is that people don't like to stick to a fixed vocabulary and grammar. So for example, if you just want to do this one command, you can kind of imagine programming something or even training a deep learning system to go to this uh, thing. Uh, but people don't like to give commands in just one way. So for example, we showed people on Amazon Mechanical Turk a video of the robot doing this relatively short uh, sequence of actions, about 30 seconds of video. And we said, describe as you would show an expert human operator, tell, that, tell, tell the human how the, the, you would, what words you would say to carry out the actions you see in this video. And they say things like, put the tire pallet on the trailer. Um, but they say a lot more things too. So they say, place the pallet of tires on the left side of the trailer. So they're doing some spatial referring expressions and they're saying exactly where they want the pallet put, whereas this first person didn't say that. Um, or they say, lift tire pallet, move to an occupied location on truck, lower tire pallet, reverse to starting location, lower forks, end. <laughs> so people, you know, this person kind of gave this, this finer grained, more detailed sequence um, talking about moving forwards and moving backwards. Um, it's perfectly understandable to, to us as, as people, um, but it's giving a lot more detailed information than, than you might expect uh, the, than the first person gave and that we kind of expected when we first uh, did this. So um, actually when we, we sort of do this task at scale, we get, we get hundreds of examples for this video and we see that no two commands are identical. People, you know, even for this really short video, use a tremendous amount of variety in the ways that they put these commands together. Um, and all of them seem pretty reasonable when you read them. Like you can be like, yes, this makes, sort of makes sense. Um, and this is just for one task. So if you kind of expand the space of tasks beyond just put the metal crate on the truck, you might want to imagine saying something really fine-grained to the robot, like move backwards 10 feet. Or you might tell the PR2 in, the, in your home, you might tell it something like tilt the picture frame to the left a little bit. OK, there, it's level. You know, really fine-grained, highly interactive sorts of commands. Um, but you also might want to give really abstract commands. So you might want to say to the forklift, move everything from receiving to storage. And then I'm going to go away and come back in an hour, and I expect this job to be done. Or you might say to the PR2, clean the kitchen while I'm at work. And I go back, and I come back in eight hours, and the kitchen better be spotless, right? Um, so you want to be able to give really, really fine-grained commands, and you also want to be able to give really, really abstract commands. And what's challenging about this is if I only give my robot access to sort of high-level commands, I lose the granularity to express those really low-level commands. But if I put the low-level commands in the space, 
then I have a search depth branching factor um, problem in my planning because I'm not going to be able to find uh, cleaning the room if I'm searching in this really low-level fine-grained space with all the different possible low-level actions that I could be doing. So we need some way to be able to have everything. We want the low-level things and we want the high-level things. Um, the other thing we had, need to do is sort of embrace failure. Uh, so robots break all the time. You know, computers break all the time. And we really don't want our robot to kind of freeze and crash or ignore the person um, or, or require the roboticist to come in when something breaks down. What we need is for the robot to be able to detect and then recover from failures to understand so that it can keep on operating autonomously and keep on trying to do what the person wants. So, for example, if you say put the metal crate on the truck and the robot's not sure what object uh, that, that the person is talking about, we'd like it to be able to ask a question like which truck and then use information from the answer in order to continue operating autonomously uh, and, and, and then sort of go on and, and, and do the next thing that it's supposed to be doing. So the fundamental challenge that, that, that we're faced with is that people want to talk to robots about everything they can see and everything they can do. So we need some kind of model that hooks into everything that robot can see and everything that robot can do. Whether we learn that model or whether we hand code it or a combination of the two, we somehow need access, we need to hook up language to everything the robot can see and everything the robots can do to make this happen. And that's kind of the aim, the problem that I'm solving in my research program. So what I'm doing, the contributions, is to enable human-robot collaboration by learning decision-theoretic models for communication, action, and perception. So we need the communication because if we want to understand language and gesture from untrained users and unscripted interactions, we need to understand how people communicate. And we need the models of action and perception because we want the person to be able to talk to the robot about everything it can see, that's perception, and everything it can do, and that's language. And by using decision theoretic models, that's going to enable the robot to detect and recover from failures to understand. So we're going to be able to reason about what we know and what we don't know and take information gathering actions to collect more information. Um, by learning, we're going to scale to very large problems. So our long-term aim is to learn these sorts of models by imposing some structure, but then within that structure, learning so that we can scale to large problems and adapt to the specific environment the robot finds itself in. Um, the decision theoretic part lets us detect and recover from failure, and by combining these two things, it can improve from experience so that you can put a robot in a new environment and have it detect and recover from failure and then learn and improve its ability to operate in that environment over time without involving a roboticist um, programming. All right, that's the high-level story. So I'm going to tell you more now about how uh, I th like, like what this looks like sort of from a technical perspective. If there's any questions, by the way, feel free to stop me and ask. Are there any questions now or comments or things you violently disagree with? Everybody agrees. Okay, sweet. All right. So the way that I think about the world is that there's a robot. It's operating in the external world. There's objects and pallets and stuff. And then there's some kind of control system that's driving the robot, that's making decisions about what actions it should take. And perceptual data from the robot sensors are coming in. So images from a camera or range sensor information from a LIDAR or joint angles from joint encoders. And then it's outputting actions, so really fine level actions like what voltage should I send to my motors, um, but also more abstract actions like drive to a particular location, make a plan and end up at this XY location. Uh, and what I want to do is augment this with human input, so human language like go to the truck or gestures like pointing or looking or any kind of human activity, and then communicative output. So I'd like to be able to respond to commands but also ask questions. And the trick, the magic, is sort of what goes on inside of this control system. 
So what I'm going to do, the way I think of it, is I take observations, and then I use those observations to make some kind of model about what I think is going on in the world. And then based on that model, I produce action. So for the RL people, this is model-based reinforcement learning. This is a model-based approach. Um, and the reason is because humans want to talk about everything we can see and everything we can do. So I think we really need that model to hook the language into. Even if we're learning those hooks, I think we need that model. And specifically, the modeling framework I'm taking is that of POMDPs, Partially Observable Markov Decision Processes. Who's seen POMDPs? Everybody. Cool. So we'll go, almost everybody, we'll go really fast. So POMDPs, there's like states, and the states are Markov, so the state only depends on the previous state. And then there's observations, so the shaded thing means you get to observe them. This is all of your sensor data. And then there's actions, right? So I get to take an action, and then depending on the action, that, that tells me something about the transition into the next state. So my current state and my current action predicts my next state. I don't get to observe my state. I only get to observe the observations. And this keeps going over. And then I have a reward function. So at each state, I get a cookie. And the robot's job is to maximize its long-term reward over time. So POMDPs, as most of you probably know since you've played with them, are really challenging to solve. So people don't like to use them. Uh, the way that I think of it is POMDPs are like Python, right? Pom Python is also undecidable, and it's really challenging <laughs> to generate Python programs, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't use it. Actually, I think the fact that they're really hard is a, is a point in their favor, because robots and AI is really hard, too. So the modeling framework that we use, it should be undecidable, right? Like, otherwise, it's, it's not going to scale to handle these problems. So the game that we have to play is the same game we play when we write a Python program, which is what are the abstractions, what are the, the simplifying assumptions we can make within the programming language or within the modeling framework in order to make it be tractable. Uh, and, and in the modeling, the graphical modeling framework, the, the sort of assumptions are what are the random variables, what is their type, what is their domain, what is their structure, and what are the conditional dependence assumptions. And every time we sort of make some of those assumptions and then train a model and then do that, that's a paper. That's kind of how the, the game that we work. And what we'll be doing is systematically going through the different parts of this POMDP and trying to understand the assumptions that we can make to enable efficient learning and inference so it's not undecidable, so that it can scale to these very large problems. So what I'm working towards is something I call the human-robot collaborative POMDP. And this is like... I was sort of joking, but I'm not really. I call it like the grand unified model of robotics or collaborative robotics, where we have this model that captures the physical sensors and the actions and the human and language in one framework so that we can talk to the robot about everything I can see and everything I can do. So then where things get interesting is what are the specific modeling structures that I'm going to use beyond just the base POMDP assumptions? So the first thing we're going to do is kind of refactor the state and divide it into the physical state of the world. So like, where's the robot, and where's all the objects, and what are its joint angles and stuff? And the human's mental state. So we're going to assume that the human, it can generalize to multiple humans, but for now we'll just say there's one human. We're going to assume that the human has goals that they want, and we don't know what they are, uh, but they're out there in the world, and that's captured by this random variable, which is the human's mental state. What does the person want? Then we can change our reward to be, we're going to try to make nice robots. So the reward is do what the person wants. You don't know what the person wants, but if you could know, you should do it. And if you do, you get a cookie. Um, so the problem then is we don't know what the person wants. So what we can do is break our observations into different types. So we can say, well, there's this physical sensors, my images and my camera, my camera and my LiDAR. And then there's language. Um, and I'm just shading it in here to say I get to observe language directly. Although in general, of course, it would go all the way to speech recognition and back. Um, but let's just say, to simplify, I, I get to observe language directly. And there's gesture. And the same thing. We use the Connect OpenNI person skeleton tracker to track gestures. We just assume it's perfect and we get to observe it. And then from these observations, we try to predict the human's mental state. So then within this framework, we can look at particular factors. So for example, this is the factor where I look at language 
and I assume I know the physical state of the world, and I try to predict the human's mental state. And this is language understanding, right? I'm trying to observe their language and estimate their mental state, their goal. Um, and then if only I know that, then I can make a plan to achieve their goal. So this factor is about, yes, sir? So, um, so perhaps you're getting to this. So mm -hmm. is, the, is, is P and H, are they continuous, or, or do you discretize them? We will discretize them. Okay. Um, I, I think exactly how these are structured is an open research question. Um, we were talking with Bill, we were talking a little bit about object hierarchies and stuff. So P is going to be broken out into objects. Like, there's going to be objects with attributes and actions. There's going to be parameterized actions. I think that there's going to be parts of it that are discrete and parts of it that are continuous. So there's going to be more and more and more structure as we go through the talk. That makes sense. Yes, sir? I think I missed uh, what the role of reward here is. Yeah. I figured like we are like inferring reward from the human <coughs> language or something like that, rather than getting a scalar reward from the environment. Yeah. So the way that I imagine, our, I, I think there's different ways you can do it. So in a lot of the work that I do, it's like a goal-based reward function. So it's zero, zero, or mi minus one, minus one, minus one to make it go fast. Minus one, and then you get a cookie when you achieve a certain state. And then the human's mental state is a predicate on states. Right? So it takes a state and says yes or no. Um, so the human's mental state is like a goal that you want the environment to be in. You can think we use predicate expressions, logical expressions, um, to represent that. And then give it, if you know it, then you try to find a plan to achieve that state. Um, if you don't know it, you can ask questions to, to get there. Make sense? OK. How, are you, uh, how do you know the prediction is correct? Like is the human saying good robot, bad robot? Or? Yeah, that is another open question. So um, in this kind of framework, I have the, the, the sort of assumption is that you are told the reward function and that you have accurate models of the observation. If you do that, you, you then get an accurate belief state update. So I, I basically get a reward for believing that I'm in a good state. And, be, and if all my models are right, if all my updates are Bayesian and everything, and correct, then that, that corresponds to get being likely to actually be in a good state, if that makes sense. Um, I am really interested in learning almost all of this. So, so, so where deep learning comes into this in my book is that there's an underlying generative model, which I'm writing down parts of right now at a, at a high level of abstraction. And deep learning, all discriminative learning, is learning particular useful factors in an underlying generative framework, right? And so, I am really interested in learning abstract actions in a discriminative deep RL kind of way. Um, so this will get hierarchical and we'll, you know, we want to learn abstract actions. I'm really interested in learning how to understand objects, images from objects, and how to predict where objects are. I'm really interested in learning how to manipulate different objects. Um, and I think that uh, if, if we set it up in the right way, it'll translate into good belief state updates that are accurate in the sense that when I think I see the cup, I, I, I really do see it with high probability. And when I think I'm not sure, I'm really not sure. And it's right. And then there's a reason to about asking questions in the right way. Um, does that make sense? OK. Mm -hmm. Dan. Is there a way in these frameworks to, to, to be able to tell when the structural assumptions you're making are hurting you? Like, so for instance, in here, you're saying language and gesture is conditionally independent given the hidden state of the person in the physical state. Uh -huh. That may or may not be true. That's right. And it may hurt you or it may not hurt you. That's right. Like, is there a way to find that out? And especially when you're saying, I think, I mean, I like a lot the yeah. idea of combining the descriptive yeah. approaches with some sort of factor model yeah. on the top. Yeah. But again, the same kind of problem of the structural assumptions you're making in the yeah. factor model. Yeah. Can you tell That's us? That's right. This? So I think there's... Uh, like if you look, like actually last time I was here, Jason, Jason's gone now, right? Jason Williams. But I had a lovely conversation with him about deep learning in the dialogue community. And basically the way that I, that my model of how they work that he kind of downloaded into my brain was that they take some system for dialogue and that's, that's gen that, that in my mind is like made by people with rules or it's a generative model or something. And then they have it do lots of dialogues. And then they train a deep model on top of that, on that data, to do 
accurate the dialogue state estimation, for example, and then use that to make the next policy. And the, what I think is that that sort of thing is limited by the assumptions of the training set. That is, it's never going, it's going to do better than the generative model did, but it's never going to sort of exceed the fundamental modeling assumptions of the generative model because it just didn't see the data. And so I am imagining that like there's going to be a sort of back and forth. Like it's expensive to collect, like the CMU um, bus thing that they do in the dialogue community, where there's this thing where I call up and get directions for buses. Like that's awesome, but it's really expensive. And so I don't want to throw my deep learning dialogue system at it for exactly the reason that you say, because it's going to be limited by the modeling assumptions. So what I, so I sort of imagine a process where we we tried our best to make uh, reasonable assumptions. We see how far it gets us. If it makes sense, we can train a deep model and kind of asymptote it out. But they're always wrong. And then the next paper is going to be like, OK, well, that was wrong. That didn't work in this user study. Or there's this thing we want the robot to do, and this model clearly can't do it. And then we enrich the model. We, we make a new assumption um, or whatever. We might, like, it might be that we have to throw more data at it. There's other, you know, we, we use our human brains to make a, a good idea on the fix. So I see it as a highly iterative process. Um, does that make sense? Um, and, I, and, I, and I think that the particular language and gesture independence assumption, while it's probably wrong, it, there's a lot to it that, 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 that goes in a good, the good direction. Um, and I don't feel that we've run it out yet, um, if that makes sense. Um, but you can disagree, and that's OK. Like, I agree to disagree about that. You know what I mean? OK. All right, so like language, any more questions? I like questions. Um, all right, so language, understanding. Um, and then I can imagine uh, communicative actions, physical actions that change the physical state of the world, and then communicative actions that change the human's mental state. So if I ask a question, if the robot asks a question to the person, that's going to change the human's mental state in a way that's going to cause them in the next turn to give me an answer to the question. Um, so I can sort of make communicative actions uh, to sort of communicate with the person. And that's what I think of as communication for collaboration. Yes? Where's the robot's planning state in that? Like, you gave us this sort of nice sort of uh, yeah. list of dis distinct ways that people could describe actions. And some of them are very, like, high level, some of them are low level. Like, that's you right. think of this sort of post ads or something that, you know, some details might be omitted or specified. And, yeah. and as I'm, as I'm it, it, imagine yeah. I'm given a low level command, I might yeah. be able to achieve the desired physical location result in a single turn of an action, right? Like, mm -hmm. I advance 10 feet mm -hmm. and I'm there. Yeah. But get, given a high level action, I might need to understand how far I've progressed yeah. in the execution of that and receive some feedback. Like, do you see that as, is that part of the human state or, or where, um, is, where does that live? Yeah, both. So actually that was like my next slide. Oh, so sorry. Very okay, nice. Oh, yeah. yeah. Nice. <laughs> um, so like basically this idea that there's this action space here and there's high level actions and there's low level actions and also the human is going to take actions, right? So the human is going to take actions, high level and low level actions. So in the sort of ultimate version of this model, the human's taking actions at different levels of abstraction that I'm trying, and that, based on what I think they want, I may be able to predict their actions, or I may be able to observe their actions, and then predict what I think they want. Or do some um, prefix of the activity, yes. yes. So you need human feedback, and then solicit yes. that feedback, and then advance. Exactly, yeah. right. Yeah. And the sort of short story about this is like hierarchical abstraction. Um, and I will talk about that in this, in this talk. I'll go into the details of what that what I think that needs to look like and what the gaps are right now. We haven't figured it all out yet, but we have some ideas about that. Um, but hierarchical abstraction. Um, and that, that sort of action for collaboration is like, how do we structure the action space so that we can handle those different levels of abstraction and so that we can learn the different uh, actions in, in a sort of an abstract space so that I can understand everything the human says tells the robot to do. And then the final piece is uh, the perception. So, like, I'm trying to estimate the physical state of the world given my observations from my physical sensors. And some of this just kind of falls out of robotics. So, like, SLAM and estimation and column filters, all you can just put them in this framework and it's right. It works. Um, it makes all these same Markov assumptions. Uh, but some of it is highly dependent on the, what the human says. So, so I already gave Bill this example. But one of my examples is I call it the speck of dust problem. So if I tell the robot to pick up that speck of dust on the floor right there, here it is, um, you know, clean it up and throw it away, 
uh, before I gave that command, I really better not be tracking all of the specks of dust in the room, or else my, the robot's brain would explode for computational reasons. I can't be doing that. Um, but as soon as I said to the robot, pick up the speck of dust, that better be like the most important thing in the robot's world, because the human said to do that, right? And so you can sort of see from this example that perception, the perceptual system, and the planning collaboration framework have to be closely tied in order to have that capability. Uh, and so we're thinking a lot about how we can hook up the perceptual system into this framework so we can handle those sorts of commands and partially observed environments, which of course is the robot. Then that's what I talk about when I talk about perception for collaboration. Okay. Um, so I am not, I could give an hour long talk about any one of these areas. Um, I'm, and, I, and we do work in all three. Um, in this talk, I'm going to focus on the communication for collaboration, uh, and I'll talk about some work um, in a highly simplified model, uh, but it's a POMDP model. And then I'll give a really high level survey of what we're doing in the other two areas in action for collaboration and perception for collaboration. So um, in communication, one of the problems we study is referring expression resolution. So the idea is that the robot is trying to deliver objects to the person. And there's a bunch of objects on the table. And we decided we wanted to simplify the, this as much as possible. So we know where all the objects are. We know what they are. We know their language models. Um, and the person is using language and gesture to communicate which object that they want the robot to hand to them. So they might point at an object and say, can I have that bowl? And we're doing speech recognition. We're getting keywords. We're getting a uh, gesture. We have a generative gesture kinds of model. Um, and then we kind of get a multinomial. And this is where I would love to talk about your framework, because we'd love to do more things. But anyway, this is just language and, and gesture. And what we get is a multinomial belief state. Right? The human's mental state is which one of these five objects I want, and I, th that they want. And the robot doesn't know, so at the beginning, it's a uniform distribution, right? because I don't know which one. Then I do an update based on the language and the gesture. And what I get is they said bull, and they pointed, and it's really clear. So I get a nice pointy posterior um, at that bull number two, and I can go off and deliver the bull. So this is an easy situation. Um, but in another situation, all I did here is I moved the person back. Um, and, what this, and I also rearranged the objects a little bit. So he says, can I have the marker? And there's actually two markers side by side here. And I moved him back, so the gesture is much harder to interpret just because you're farther away. So the same covariance model says this is much more ambiguous. And what happens is I do my same belief update. And what I get is this bimodal distribution where it's not sure which of it, it knew it wasn't the spoons or the bowls, but it's not sure which of the markers um, I, should, I should hand over. So the question is, what should the robot do in this sort of situation? How can we make it automatically decide to, to hand over the object when it's sure, but do intelligent information gathering actions when it's not sure? So we can come back to these kind of POMDP models. And we, what we did is made like a radically simplified version of this, which we call the FETCH POMDP, the Feedback for Collaborative Handoff POMDP, so we get the nice acronym, FETCH, um, where we get we factored the language into base language, which is like a keyword kind of language model, and response language, which means we think that they're answering a question that we already asked, and we're going to use the answer to update our belief state. And then the gesture. Um, and the state is the human's desired item, and, the, and if we asked a question, the, the question that we asked. Um, so we're going to be able to ask questions like, do you mean this one? Do you mean this one? Do you mean this one? So that's what this, uh, this item is. And our goal is to hand the correct item as fast as we can. That's the reward function. Um, and what this lets the robot do is essentially the optimal policy in this sort of belief state works out to be to ask a question. And it automatically decides to ask a question. It decides what object to ask about. Um, and then based on the information from the answer, they say, no, not that one. So it's a negative answer. They can figure out, oh, OK, it's the other marker. Um, and go off and uh, hand off the correct object. Um, and what we did in the video. Final answer. You wanted object four. So this is easy. We're close. We're sure. We go off. We do the right thing. Um, and this is the harder case. Can I have the metal object over there? This one? No, the other screen. Can I have the metal object over there? 
final answer, you wanted object six. Um, so what you can see is the same algorithm, the same model, the same everything is automatically deciding in one case to deliver the object. In the other case, it's deciding to ask a question to gather more information. It's driven by this Bayesian decision theoretic framework. So uh, with multimodal language and gesture. So um, we did this a user study to um, sort of assess how well it works. Uh, we had 16 participants with a within subjects design. So Bill was asking, how can we afford to have so many people <coughs> within subjects is like the way. Because each person gets to use all the different conditions. So they come in and we get four different kind of data points out of them from uh, interacting with all of the systems. Uh, and we compared it to never ask a question, always ask a question with a fixed policy, and intelligently asking a question with this Bayesian grounded kind of framework. Um, and we measure the speed of the interaction and the accuracy of the interaction. Um, so the, the unambiguous condition, they're close, and the objects are spread out, and there's no two similar named objects side by side. In the ambiguous condition, we move them farther away, and we arrange the objects so that the bowls are next to each other and the markers are next to each other, so that we get these, this, this naturally, we get these harder interactions. Um, and what we get, this is the, the sort of graph of all the results, um, but the sort of one line summary of the results is that we're about two seconds faster, 25% faster, um, when we intelligently ask a question. Um, and we're more accurate, even than always asking a question. Uh, so it really works better. And they also li they like it better. Um, I think we don't have those numbers, but we also asked them how much they like it, what's the NASA TLX workload, and stuff. Um, and we were surprised. We thought always asking a question would be better than intelligently asking a question, but it turns out that asking too many questions confuses people, and it just gives you more opportunity to screw up. So if you already know, asking more questions actually makes things go worse. Um, so, so the intelligently asking a question was better than always asking a question. And 38% of our users thought the system could understand propositional phrases like to the left of and, and near and stuff like that even though it can't. Um, and our hypothesis about why is because it was so natural the way that it asked the question so quickly that they, they, they gave the system more credit than it actually had in terms of its spatial language and semantic understanding ability. Um, and this is published at ICRA last year. Question? Uh, yes. Did you have the same number of objects and same types of objects mm -hmm. across? Yeah, so for this study, we controlled the number and the types of objects. We just changed um, how far mm -hmm. apart they were, how far away the user stood, uh, and the order of them. So you can see the bowl here, you can, you can see the spoon, and the spoon are far apart, so gesture's really, really good. Um, when you're, when you're that, standing that close and the, and the marker's over there, you say the marker and you point, it's very, it's very sure. Um, versus the far away. And, and this, is, this is sort of less interesting, this is more of a baseline condition. We wanted a condition where it was really, we were getting really reliable signal so that we could compare it to the condition when we're far away and we rearranged so the spoons are side by side. Because gesture would work too well otherwise. You know, and we never needed to ask a question. So we wanted to create a need to ask questions. Um, yes, sir. Um, what kind of belief state solvers are you running? So that's a really good question. Um, we explored a couple different algorithms for this. Um, so we played with POMCP, but it doesn't really like uh, these kinds of problems because it has to sort of look ahead and, and it, it runs out of particles. Um, we did try NAC, which Natural Extra Critic, mm -hmm. which it's really strange actually if you're an RL person and you, mm -hmm. and you look at the dialogue people using NAC. It's an RL algorithm, but it's like being used in POMVPs. Mm -hmm. And the problem with uh, NAC is that you have to train, you have to essentially you train the solver before you do the study. Um, and so it's kind of a pain. So in this system, we used belief sparse sampling, which is kind of a sampling algorithm, kind of like POMDP, POMCP. Mm -hmm. um, and we're really not, and you saw that was quite fast, but of course, this is quite a small problem. Uh, and so one of our areas of research, uh, very actively right now, is better inference algorithms. So we've done, and I will talk about our particle abstraction work, that is done in the setting of MDPs and not POMDPs. Mm -hmm. But one of my bets is that particle abstraction is going to give you a big savings in terms of POMDP 
inference. Um, and we also have a couple other POMDP, POMCP kind of extensions. So like POMCP, if you're a POMDP person, you know it does rejection sampling in the observation space. And for language, that's bad because the observations of language you could get is really huge. And what you're doing at inference time is sampling from the model until you get the exact same thing the person said, right. um, which is bad. <laughs> That'll take a long time. So we have a couple of tricks to solve that problem. So we have a, a riff on POMCP that we've been playing with. Um, and then we, the other thing that we started to play with is objects and POMCP. So if you assume that the, that doesn't work in this problem, but if you're looking for objects and you assume that the locations are conditionally independent, then you can basically run separate particles for each of the objects and combine them back together and get a really big savings for a relatively straightforward trick. And we're just starting to think about abstraction. Um, in that. Have you thought about hindsight optimization as a solver? No. Because, I mean, finding good tractability in yeah. There's limitations there, yeah. but, it, yeah. but, but it seems to yeah. help a lot. Let's talk about it. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I think that's one of the open problems, and one of the things that's holding us back is, is yeah. uh, inference. And my bet was that we needed more structure. So what we're doing first, or now anyway, is abstraction and POMDPs, mm -hmm. um, hoping that that's going to give you uh, an acceleration. All right. So that, um, we sort of, going back to this model, we can sort of see that the language, which is I, I wrote up here, is one thing. We're using a unigram language model, so we can assume that all the words are independent, and you get this kind of thing. Um, and if you know my prior work in uh, compositional semantics, learning models for words like near and stuff from from data, actually, it's not, I don't I don't really believe it's a unigram model. I think that it's some kind of compositional parse structurey thing that's learned from lots of data. Um, that's going on inside of, of this factor. And our long-term goal is to put that inside of a POMDP framework so that we can ask kind of compositional questions and, and stuff uh, that we were doing in, in the pre-POMDP G-Cube days. I had some papers about question asking. Um, all right. And we have some other work. I'm not going to have time to talk about it, but like we could sh generate um, intelligent uh, requests for help, for example. So there was a paper at RSS a few years ago where the robot needs something so it can say, help me, but that's not very clear. Um, so you might imagine saying, please hand me the white table leg. But the thing is, there's three table legs in this scene here. And it's not clear from this expression which one the robot needs. The one this robot needs is the one that's here on the white table, because that's the one that's out of its reach. Um, and so we had a, a, kind of a tricky algorithm that does inverse semantics to reason that this is ambiguous in this particular scene. So it's better to say this longer expression, please hand me the leg that's on the white table, um, in order to get the person to do what you want. And this is using compositional semantics. And I, I still believe in it. I think we should use it. Um, but what I, what, what I wanted to do in the earlier work was kind of build up towards a POMDP framework so that we could kind of have this uh, unified approach. Um, so that's like. The, the action space also factors in the, in the language way. So, um, so that's kind of a deeper dive into communication for collaboration. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about our action abstraction work and just the briefest overview of our perception stuff um, before I finish up. I finish up at, at 1130, right? Yeah, but you can yeah. have the room to go up. Well, yeah. yeah, I'll finish up at 1130. So we kind of had this example before. We want to understand abstract things like put the metal crate on the truck, fine grain things like move backwards 10 feet, and really, really abstract things like move everything from receiving to storage. So that's sort of getting at this question of like, how do I structure the action space that, um, that I was asked at the beginning? And the thing about existing hierarchical planning, um, so like if you're an RL person, there's like options and macro actions. If you're a planning person, there's task, HTNs, hierarchical task networks. Um, and this is also RL, this is like a, a max Q kind of assumption, uh, a world. All of these algorithms make the assumption that at planning time, you're going to essentially potentially explore the entire space. Um, and they also make the assumption that you're going to get to sort of reset yourself back into the same state that you started in. Um, from the time that you define the, the options or the hierarchical abstraction. So I, I named these assumptions um, after a movie, which maybe you've seen, Groundhog Day. Have you seen it? 
Um, most people, good. Uh, this is Bill Murray, and what happens is he like wakes up every day, and it's February 2nd, and the same songs playing on the radio, and the same announcers have the same conversation. It's the same thing over and over and over. Um, and nobody else realizes this, but he gets memory day by day by day. Um, so the Groundhog Day assumptions are the assumptions that a large fraction of RL planning research makes. Um, and it's great because we like to make assumptions and they simplify the inference and they've gotten, we've gotten a lot of mileage from these assumptions. But of course, it lets you learn sort of strange things. So this is an example from the movie. Um, he's going to rob a bank. So he knows every day at 2 or 3 p.m., they drop some quarters. They're all going to be on the ground. And he can walk up behind the bank guards and steal the, the bag of money. So here he goes. Um, and it works, right? It, it's, a, it's, a, it's one way. It's, it's a valid way to, to rob the bank. However, it's not going to generalize to the next day when you have no guarantee that the quarters are going to be dropped. This is something you're learning as kind of an artifact of these assumptions. Uh, and this is sort of the, the problem with a lot of the existing hierarchical abstraction when you start to imagine using it for language understanding. Um, because what you want is to be able to put the robot in a new situation, maybe with objects it's seen before, and give it a new command, maybe with words it's seen before, but a new command, and have it immediately find a policy to, to solve, to obey that instruction. So we defined a, a new kind of hierarchical abstraction. It's a generalization of options. We call them abstract MDPs. And the trick with an AMDP is that an action in the abstract MDP defines a reward function one level down, not a policy like an option. Um, so that means the, act, the abstract action defines a goal one level down. Um, and then there's a state abstraction function from child states to abstract states. Um, and what this lets you do is, because you're sort of planning in this goal space, if the low-level state's different and the policy doesn't work anymore, you still have a planner that knows the goal, and you can solve the planner from the new situation. Now, if you do have a good option, great, use it. Um, it fits, because you can just say, well, this is an option, and this is the termination state, and if this works to solve the abstract action without having to actually run the planner, and it's reliable, use it. Um, so it's a generalization of options. But you can also have uh, hierarchies where you can use domain-specific heuristics like A star when it makes sense uh, in order to get um, much faster speed-ups in your planning time. So we used AMDPs in a, a simulated domain which uh, for a pick-and-place mobile manipulator robot that's moving objects around in a grid. We call it cleanup world. And we defined, manually defined a hierarchy, so I won't go into the details, but like moving objects. So the low-level actions are north, south, east, west, and the higher-level actions are moving objects around. Uh, and what we can do is enable the agent to find these high-level commands uh, from any continuous location, even if we mess with the agent, because it's not just doing a blind sequence of actions. So it's trying to get the orange block to the blue room. And he's pulling the block out of the gripper. Oh no, what happened? Uh, but it's able to automatically replan to go get the orange block and put it in the, in the, the blue room because it understands its goal, not just a policy. Um, this is an MDP, right? This is an MDP, so yeah. So we're in the MDP, I should have said, we're in the MDP setting now. Um, I want this all to be a pound MDP. In the MDP setting, we just assume that we, that the, that the language maps to uh, a, a goal state, and we're just trying to get to that goal state, and there's no uncertainty, even though I believe that there should be, and we should ask questions. Sure. Um, okay. Um, so then we can use this to understand language at different levels of abstraction by basically treating the level in the AMDP hierarchy as a latent variable that we infer. So we throw, um, so this is like the same command in low level space, go down five, right five, one up, right four, down one, left one, and up three. Um, but you could also say take the red chair to the blue room. Um, and what we do is we, map, we learn to map this kind of command to the low level space and the other kind of command to the high level space. So I'm going to skip the sort of details of that. Um, but there's, I don't have the, the model dialing, but there's an RNM model. Um, that maps from the, so it, uh, it basically learning this, this uh, distribution over the reward function expressed as a predicate and the level given the natural language command. Um, and this was at RSS last year that lets it understand commands in an MDP setting at different levels of abstraction. 
Um, so here we can kind of see that the language, the action space, is actually hierarchical. Um, and the AMDPs is one step in the MDP setting for, for getting this. We're really, I think, what we're actively working on now, we don't have any results yet, is uh, POMDPs and abstract actions. So I'll skip. There's a video. I'll show you the video. So he, here he's giving an abstract command, take the block to the green room. And it maps this to a goal, and it figures out, it's going to speed up in a minute, it's going to figure out the action sequence. And if we don't move the block in this video, but if it did move the block, it would, it would do all the stuff you saw in the other video. Um, so he's going to give a sort of medium level command, so go to the red room. So it's, it's uh, not manipulating a block, but just moving the robot around. Um, there we go. And then he can give a really low level command like go south, 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 or go south one time. Um, in this case, going south by three grid cells. Yes? Does the robot know beforehand which is the red room? Is there a map? Yes. So these this is a fully orientation. Yeah. Like yeah. So this is a fully observed environment. Um, we're, we're doing this in a motion tracker. Mm -hmm. So we know where the, the reason we were able to replan and find that block is because there's a mo motion tracker on the block and on the robot, and it's given the location and grid cells of these rooms with predicates. Um, we are actively working at relaxing that assumption. So we're trying to have um, semantic mapping running at the same time in, at, at the POMDP at one level, and so they can be doing uh, more interesting commands. But in this work, MDP, we know everything, um, but we don't know what the person is telling us to do. OK, so that's a taste of action for collaboration. Um, I will maybe just show like one or two slides about perception. So, um, so this is sort of motivated by the existence of fiducial systems in HRI, robotics research, where people kind of just punt on perception uh, instead of trying to make it work reliably. And you know, looking at environments like this is the International Space Station, where there's very complex objects all over the place. Um, and we really want to be able to manipulate things in this sort of environment. Um, we'd like to be able to do very fine-grained manipulation tasks. So this is a quarter-inch nut on a bolt. We'd like to be able to see the nut, see the bolt, and put the nut on the bolt, right? And we'd like to be able to do household tasks, which have lots. This is the dishwasher at my dad's house in Rochester, New York. Um, and there's you know, some shiny, transparent things, which are quite hard to see with conventional computer vision. Connect doesn't do so great on these sorts of things because they are objects that are not on lambertian that bend the light around. Um, we even like to be able to wash the dishes. Um, so here's my lab with a sink, and a, we put a pump in there to simulate the water, I mean, it moves the water around. Um, and this is challenging because the water is rippling, and you see the reflections of the lights on the water. Um, and the same reflections are visible in the fork. So it's very hard to, to sort of do these tasks. Um, so we have a trick that basically turns a seven degree of freedom arm with a camera in the arm into a synthetic aperture light field camera. Um, so what we do is exploit the robot's ability to move its camera to image each point on the object from multiple different perspectives um, and then make synthetic photographs of the scene as if it was rendered through a 35 centimeter lens, which you can't carry around in your back pocket. Um, and then, uh, allows us to do very fine-grained perception. So this is where you know, we, we, we can basically use this as a trick to do inverse graphics um, with objects and do all kinds of tricks. So we can do the nut on the bolt. Um, so this is moving that camera around to scan the scene. It localizes both the nut and the bolt with the vision, with a monocular camera. It's a regular camera that moves. It's not a connect, and it's not a lenticular array or anything like that. It's a monocular RGB camera that moves. Um, and put the nut on the bolt. We can do these objects. So like, this is with just one image, and we get that wine glass three out of 10 times. We get the fork, 10 out of 10, the green fork, which is not shiny. Um, if we use light fields and stuff, then we get the wine glass 10 out of 10 times. Um, basically, by f uh, focusing on the distortions that the bottom of the objects make on the table, um, and we can do the fork. Um, this is the synthetic photo. This is like the one image where you see all the reflections. This is the synthetic image where we drop resolution. It's blurry. 
but the reflections are basically gone. Uh, and people say, how is this different from image averaging? It is image averaging. It's the right kind of averaging to do when you see multiple camera viewing angles. Um, so it works for the same reason image averaging works, but it works better because you're doing it at multiple different angles. Um, so the fork pops out, and we can very reliably pick up the fork. Um, this is showing 24 out of 25 picks with the sink being turbulated, so the, the water's moving around. OK, so I will finish there. Um, we sort of started out with this POMDP model, and we saw that it's actually a lot is going on. And this is a road I'm still on. Um, I think that there's a lot of work to be done uh, before we solve this problem. But that's sort of where I'm going and how I think about the world. So learning models of language, action, and perception for human-robot collaboration. Thank you. Questions? Yeah. So what do you think about all the model-free joint perception and action um, work that is popular in some segments? Yeah, like so like image captioning oh, and no, stuff? Um, or, like, um, or like what Yoa was doing. Uh, or like uh, how Peter and Sergey and they're doing this like, yeah. uh, well, the deep is, is a side effect. Of yeah. Uh, yeah. So for all of the deep learning and robotics work, the trick that they're, that they're playing is where do you get the reward function mm -hmm. or the cost function when you're doing that stuff? So, for example, in the Google um, Arm. Uh, Google Arm Farm, yeah. when they were learning to open doors, uh, one way they actually wired the door. So that so the the thing is, you have to you can't give a cost function unless you know when you've opened the door or not. And they actually wired the door to automatically tell the robot when it opened the door or not. Um, in another one of their papers, they do learning from demonstration. So like. Um, they were doing virtual reality demonstrations to teleoperate the robot through the task and then trying to learn from that tasks. So I think um, that is it's great work. And I think that the trick, or the thing that, that's, there's sort of two things stopping it from scaling. One is where does the reward function come from? Is it a demonstration? If so, where are we going to get lots of demonstrations? Is it a loss function? We really don't want to wire all the doors. I kind of come back to model-based techniques because I want to be able to learn to detect with my camera that the door is open and the door is closed. And then go use their, once I have that detector, go back and use their stuff to learn a door opening skill. Mm -hmm. um, when I think about AMDPs and options and stuff, like that's a more policy based way. Mm -hmm. I am happy to take my robot around and have it, you know, give it some demonstrations and practice and put it as one of the abstract skills in that framework. So I want that stuff. I think it's, it's good, but I think for, for like the, the whole stack, it's one part of the, the full stack. Right. Um, we are using, we have an active project in our lab right now implementing one of the deep uh, robot learning for demonstration algorithms. We have a VR, HTC Vive teleoperation stack. So you can teleoperate the robot inside of virtual reality. Um, and we also have the hollow, I didn't show the videos of this, but like we have the hollow ones hooked up to our robots as well. So like you can see, overlaid in AR, the robot's future trajectory. You can give commands. And I'm really excited about semantic mapping with the HoloLens. So like, I'd like to be able to like annotate the doorknob with the HoloLens. Mm -hmm. um, or like with the drone, I really want to annotate like the green box and the red box and the augmented reality space. And then say, drone, fly between the red box and the green box and have it be able to make those sorts of plans. Uh, so I think that. I'm really actually quite excited because I think that the, the sort of deep RL for robotics work and augmented reality and virtual reality and these kinds of hierarchical abstractions from language are showing this potential. Like they can all solve each other's problems because mm -hmm. if the AR and language and intelligently asking questions can come back and provide the cost function or the loss function for the net, then, and then the net can provide really good policies for the abstraction, I think that you know, it will be awesome. Yes, sir. So thinking about the collaborative game theory aspect uh -huh. to think about collaboration, right? Yeah. And so I'm, I'm wondering where this might hit the ceiling when I'm thinking about humans' mental states as this. Yeah, yeah, problem. yeah, yeah. So there's an IPOMDP. There's two different IPOMDPs. There was one, I forgot the, his name, but the, the one that's not Finale Doshi, that's the infinite POMDP, but the interactive POMDP, where they actually try to write down 
what I think about what you think about what I think about what you think. And then there's like Christopher Potts also at Stanford has some very interesting work in this vein. Adam Vogel had a nice paper about using deck POMDPs to do to do that sort of modeling. And I think this like I basically am not there yet. Like like so so and it, I don't think that in the in the real problem it is a deck POMDP because in the deck POMDP the agents get to kind of co coordinate their responses. Whereas in the POMDP setting, the human is simply part of the environment. Um, and then you're trying to model their mental state. And maybe part of their model, of your model for their mental state, is what they think of your mental state. Um, my bet is that that bottoms out in not too many levels. And the other thing that I think, but we haven't gotten to work yet, is that probabilistic programming is the answer mm -hmm. when it is important. Uh, and so we tried to write down the math in the sort of IPOMDP way, and it was, it was a disaster. The math just explodes. Um, but like, if you ever see Noah Goodman at Stanford talk um, with the uh, probabilistic programming model, um, I think that is the right way to write it down. And I'm hopeful. We just got our POMDP framework ported to Python, and we started using PyTorch. And PyTorch has Pyro, which is Noah's probabilistic deep framework. And I'm hoping that if we collide that at high speed with the fetch POMDP, the model I talked about for referring expressions, we'll get some nice Dirichlets out of that. Um, and we'll be able to think about the multiple levels of indirection. But that said, it's been hard for me. Like, the fetch POMDP actually works really well, like, um, without any of that. You know, it's just modeling the human's mental state and as a belief state, and that's it. Um, so it is not clear how important that is in terms of like functionality. Um, so the other direction we're pushing is like increasing the complexity of the mental state representation from a multinomial to a more rich predicate expression. Um, and ultimately, I believe it should be learned. So like, mm -hmm. I am thinking of it right now. We're thinking about it as learning the predicates, but we also feel I feel okay. For example, giving it something like LTL um, as part of its predicate language. So LTL is linear temporal logic. It understands, it's got expressions for things like eventually and finally and stuff. So you can say things like go back and forth in the hallway until I come in and then go to my office um, in a logical expression. And so what I'm imagining is like we'll give it the LTL primitives and stuff and then it'll learn predicates like I come in from vision to uh, perception, and then it's like a probabilistic predicate that then drives the planner um, in the end. Yes? Do you think LTL, when you have some experience with LTL? We do, yeah. We just actually had an LTL paper published. It's going to be presented over the summer. I see. Um, and it's in the, so like a lot of our language papers look like, let's change the mental state representation and add LTL to it. So, that, so I told you about the AMDP one, which was let's change the mental state representation and add hierarchy to it. Mm -hmm. um, so we have one where we, we just got accepted where we add LTL to it. Um, Do you find and I was that the pretty happy. solvers are fast enough? Because under, underneath, it's, uh, meaning unless you are using the convex subset of LTL, you, right. you, the non-convex subset means right. you branch and bound and throw it to good OB and hope for the best to happen. Right. Um, right. So the, in, the, in that paper, we got it to go fast enough to make a video, but we mm -hmm. Definitely, we're struggling with the solvers, especially as you scale to more complex problems. And as the number of predicates increases. And as the number of predicates increases, yes. So, I that is an, that is an open question. Right. Um, I like LTL though because there's things in, that language definitely has that mm -hmm. it captures very nicely. So I wanted to like say like let's just try yeah and yeah, see yeah. and then you know see where it breaks um, and then you know my my normal answer is hard co abstraction is going to save us. Yeah. Um, the, one of the one of the solvers that we use G, is an MDP LTL hybrid. It's called GLTL geometric LTL that Michael Lippmann made up. That um, basically augments. What's nice about it is it augments the state of the MT, MDP so that the LTL expression is Markov and the augmented L, MDP. So the trick about LTL is that these expressions like go through the blue room to the red room is not Markov in the robot, in the state which includes the robot's location. Because if I have to go through the blue room, I have to evaluate essentially the trajectory of the robot. And the sort of naive non-Markov thing is remember the whole history, but that's crazy. Yeah. So Michael's GLTL remembers just the parts of the state relevant to that 
expression, which I found you don't naively promising. Just put in the so you're not naively head. saving all of the state when you're doing the solver. Um, so that's cool. that's a good yeah. trick. That was a nice trick. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. So in this framework, it seems like the the task is always sort of one way in the sense that the robot's always trying to maximize what the person wants. Yes. But I feel like in the real world, there's probably rewards coming from a whole lot of places. Absolutely. So people have like yes. different, you know, strengths and yep. So yep. And I think the collaboration looks different when the robot might be able to do something better than the person. What does that collaboration look like? Uh, yep. When are you like a teammate versus yep, 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 yep. Sort of Absolutely. Like the, yeah, I don't want to minimize the importance of that. Um, it. My 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 attack, my personal attack, is let's figure out one person before we figure out the team's stuff. Um, but Julie Shaw, for example, at MIT is doing some wonderful work in that setting. Uh, even Adam Vogel's paper with the DEF COM DP is thinking about kind of teaming kinds of situations. And I definitely think that's really important. And you know, I can just wait. I, I'm gonna. I mean, I could give you a, a facile answer of. Oh, I can just have more. I can make this into a plate with lots of people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but it's definitely more than more than that. Um, but my personal focus was just I want to figure out one person and increase the complexity of the language, increase the number of sensors I'm taking in before I jump to the team environment. Uh, but it's not because I don't think it's important. It's just yeah. can't do everything. Romy is from Julie's group. Oh, you are. Yeah. Oh, cool. <laughs> Super. <laughs> yeah, Julie's awesome. Um, yeah. So. Um, Looking at these different observations yeah. and physical states and things like that, they seem to be running at different time scales, right? Uh -huh. Like physical sensors. Are, right? Absolutely. This POM DP formalization yes. requires me to reason about all of them at like, the one that changes the fastest. Yeah. So is there something yeah. I can exploit? Yeah. Them? So my hope is that if we figure out hierarchical abstraction right, we will be able to do everything. So for example, in our MDP domain, our low-level fine-grained actions run at 30 hertz. Right. Um, the the low-level motor controllers. And then we put grid cells on top of that. So the abstract action is use your low-level controller to go to a new grid cell. And then we put object manipulation on top of that. So then use your like grid cell manipulation to pick up the object and go somewhere somewhere else. In the POMDP setting, we haven't worked it all out yet. But what I hope is that SLAM and Colin filters, um, if you're a roboticist, those these sort of standard estimation techniques that are that work really well, like the Hollywoods, when they work, they, they figured out SLAM. Um, actually, SLAM looks very much like a POMDP. So like, if I go back to my generic POMDP model, in SLAM, the state is the map, uh, which is the location of all the objects, and my trajectory through the environment, the robot's location. The observations are my range sensor readings. Um, the reward doesn't exist uh, because I don't get to pick my actions. Uh, instead, I merely observe my control inputs. I don't get to pick my control inputs. Um, so we're actually working now on, and there are there's some work in like POMDP SLAM where you try to automatically infer where the robot goes. In most SLAM, mm -hmm. it's either like the HoloLens where the person is walking around and is trying to decide, or the person is teleoperating the robot to, to decide how to make the map. In POMDP SLAM, you don't just get to observe your control inputs, you get to choose them. Uh, and then you might imagine choosing them for different reasons. Uh, and what I hope is that, you know, all, all the independence assumptions for SLAM, so like the, the, th the key thing that makes SLAM work is that the, the object, the lo object locations are conditionally independent given the trajectory of the robot. That's the thing that makes SLAM go. Um, if I don't know my true trajectory, then all my locations are, are estimates are dependent. But if I know my true trajectory, then they're independent. And all SLAM exploits that assumption to make it to make it work. And you can you should be able to make those same assumptions and run the same, you know, Rao Blackalized particle filter. Everybody does like like uh, least squares now, but like, you know, the same stuff and have it work for the same reasons. I don't want to reinvent any of that. Um, but I do want to figure out how to choose my own actions and have different reward functions, like maybe I'd like to make the most complete map possible. Or maybe I'm told, one of our motivating examples is go find the red block in the lobby. And I, it's down the hall that way. And I don't have a complete map yet. I'd like to be able to reason, OK, I should go down the hall. And as I go, I'm running my slam and get to the lobby. And then somehow I think it's the lobby. Maybe I have to ask if it's the lobby. And then look for the red block all in, in one framework. Um, so the slam is kind of running 
in my mind, it's like the lowest, one of the lower levels of abstraction. Running it, you know, it's, it's 30 hertz or whatever update it's doing based on the range sensors and the odometry readings. Um, but then the actions are getting picked by something higher. Um, mm -hmm. So that's why I talk about the grand unified model of robotics. You know, so SLAM is one of the great success stories in robotics. Um, SLAM, you know, it's, it, it works really well. It's, you see it in the HoloLens. It's being used um, in, in any time you see a mobile robot going around. Um, there's SLAM. There's wonderful off-the-shelf open source SLAM software. Um, and the algorithm is so beautiful. It's really, I teach it in AI and stuff. It's really a beautiful uh, success story. Um, and I'm excited because it just drops into this framework. Um, and I don't think you sh I think that's good. I don't think you should reinvent it. So I'm curious how you think about the, so like I feel there's a challenge in that I see a lot of successes in physical tasks, in things uh -huh. that have to do with the world being continuous. Like you yep. can balance a pendulum, yep, yep, yep. it's pretty yep. easy. Yep. Um, however, once you go into this world of language and where things like, I, I feel the value functions and everything, it's much more, Yes. Like you fall off a cliff in random yes, places absolutely. and it's, it's much, like I wonder yeah. if the success of SLAM and techniques like that has to do with the continuity and the I, I, I of very the much agree with that. Uh -huh. And what I think, the, the, I think hierarchical abstraction is key because yeah. exact, the reason it's good is because it puts you in these continuous sub-problems. Mm -hmm. And it puts the, the, the it, it, like, like if, if we get, I mean, hope, a hypothesis, if we get it set up right, we'll be in this like, all the, the, the ugly points happen in a discontinuous spot, and we can put an abstract action there to say, here's the continuous subproblem, and now I'm going to get it in a new manifold with another continuous yeah. subproblem. Mm -hmm. um, so, so, for example, is, is I, I kind of briefly talked about A star. Um, if I'm doing manipulation, so like I'm going to go and pick up my water bottle and move it over here. A star, you know, for path planning, is a very well-known algorithm for like, you know, A star is, is optimal over algorithm. A is algorithms, and A star is is for being optimal algorithm for doing these kinds of like search problems with heuristics. The thing is, if I'm trying to go here and pick up this object and come back, the Euclidean distance heuristic for planning is terrible because I have to walk away from my goal to pick up the object and then walk back. Right? It's not admissible heuristic anymore. I can't use A star, this wonderful algorithm. But if I introduce hierarchy, mm -hmm. I can say, OK, my abstract action is to get over here. My heuristic's great. I can walk over here. Then I use my abstract action to pick something up. And then I'm back using A star, my admissible heuristic, to come back here. And, and I get back these algorithmic guarantees. I can use my heuristic in the right way without having to reinvent A star or whatever path plane I want to use. It's, it just fits. So my bet is, is hierarchy will save us. And um, you can see that in all the Montezuma's revenge and whatnot. Like yes. Hierarchy. Yeah. So um, the student I was talking about at the beginning, mm -hmm. actually, that was what he was working on. It was hierarchical abstraction in Montezuma's revenge. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and it works. It's great. I mean, if you mm -hmm. give it a good abstraction, it's able to solve the game. The, the, I can talk only can't solve. The thing that sucks is he can't solve the real game, because the thing that the intrinsic motivation paper could do is uh, the, the, essentially the tightrope trap. So I don't know how much of you played it, but there's these traps in MR where you have to do the right thing for a really long time to get past the trap. Mm -hmm. And it's really hard. Like, it's basically impossible to do it with epsilon greedy because you will just fall, fall off, off the cliff. Trip. You're guaranteed to fall off the, crip, the cliff. So the intrinsic motivation in their reported results <laughs> claims to be able to solve this problem and solve these time-based traps, but we and other groups have not been able to reproduce this result, and we don't know why. Mm -hmm. um, so we can't solve time-based traps, uh, but we can, what, what intrinsic motivation can't do is the, the key, it's basically what you have to do in the game is you have to go and get a key and then backtrack, let's, let's say that I start here, um, there's a door, right? I have to go and get a key and then backtrack to the door, which is near where I started, unlock the door and go through. And intrinsic motivation is like, wow, I'm in this world where I have a key and everything is new, but this is more new than way back there. So it never actually gets through the door. The way that it gets through the door is by suiciding. Because if you suicide and lose a life, you go back to the start state and then it figures out it can get through the door. If you take out suiciding, it cannot reason that it needs yeah. to go back. And this is the classic problem of exploiting idiosyncrasies yeah. of the similar That's right. Right. That's right. Absolutely. <laughs> so my student did this. Like he took, he took out, he made a model of MRR, took out the suicide, and 
showed the one that's going to see of you, um, Mel. Um, and he showed that like intrinsic motivation can't solve it if you suicide mm -hmm. in our simulated MR. But we cannot reproduce intrinsic what they claim to be good at, which was these tightrope traps. And so we can't beat real MR because we can't even reproduce their results, which were getting farther than anybody had gotten, but which couldn't do this key stuff in real MR. So like, so like if only we could figure out what they did or reinvent what they did or make a new thing that does what they did for real instead of for not real. I think they did it for real, but like, you know how it is. Um, anyway, if we could just do those tightrope chaps, we could solve MR. Um, so, we'll see. Yes? Um, in this case, like, in the example that you showed, the human mental state was sort of like what objects wanted, but yeah. it seems like the human mental state has a really rich representation, probably a lot of work in cognitive science. Absolutely right. But I think the challenge is like the human state, the structure of the human yeah. state, like yeah. changes with, like right now I might be thinking like, what yep. are you thinking about when I ask this question? Yep. But like during lunchtime, I might yep. be thinking like, what, you know, yep. what food do you want? Yep. So like the structure yep. itself is changing with time. How do you deal with that? I consider the human mental state representation to be an open research question. Yeah. Um, and I think that there's some parts of it that are fixed, so I suspect, or, or that we can treat as mostly fixed. Um, uh, so things like the, something like LTL that does time-based expressions is probably pretty fixed. There's probably some spatial primitives that are pretty fixed, like near and stuff like that. Um, and I suspect that some other part, there's like some compositional operator, uh, like it's, it's some kind of predicate sort of thing I, is probably the right way to think about it. Um, and some parts of it are learned, and it's clearly way, way, way more than the um, multidomials that I'm, that I'm using. Uh, and there's kind of two threads of work in my group right now. So the POMDP uses very impoverished mental state representations in order to explore what it's like to have language and gesture, to have multimodal question asking and stuff. The language understanding work says no POMDPs, we're going to use MDPs, but we're going to try to understand what sorts of mental state representations make sense. And what those papers look like is, wow, we'd really like to be able to understand back and forth. Let's try using LTL as a mental state representation. Um, wow, we'd really like to be able to understand hierarchy. Let's try hierarchy as a mental state representation. Um, I, have, I have hopes that if we get the hierarchy right, then you could sort of, I was sort of imagining that there would be like a mode where I'm collaborating with the human and I know the hierarchy, I know the hierarchical abstraction, but I don't know where I am or who's doing what role, if there was roles in the hierarchy. And then I'm watching the person and I'm doing my thing and I'm hoping that some of what Julie does would like fall out of, of that because it would, it would be like, okay, I'm trying to infer where they are in the hierarchy and what to do next. And then I was imagining a version where I know that there's a hierarchy and maybe I know some things about what the hierarchy is like. Like maybe I know that it's something like AMDPs. And I maybe have some constraining assumptions about the sorts of hierarchies people do. But I don't know the actual hierarchy. So like if you were imagining a Julie kind of task like object assembly or something like that, in, in the like, 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 like I know that we're trying to make this part and that these screws go in this hole and someone's got to do this and someone's got to do that but I'm trying to figure that out. That's where I know the hierarchy. In the not knowing the hierarchies version, I'm just here and I don't even know what we're building, you know, and I have to try to infer that, oh, look, there's some screws and the human seems to be putting the screw in the hole, so maybe I can try to infer the hierarchy from language, from demonstrations, and then you get into like something like semantic mapping or something where you're learning skills and stuff, and that's way beyond where we are now, but I, but I imagine that's going, I hope if I'm successful in you know, four years, that's what we're going to be doing, is trying to handle the, I don't know, the. We, 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 I hope that we'll be in this space where, like, we understand something about the hierarchical structures, but we don't, but now we're going to start to think about when we don't know the hierarchy. Um, so and we like work closely. Yeah. Like a belief space of her. Yeah, 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 yeah. Absolutely, absolutely right. Yeah, it is. I don't know which abstract action space I'm in. I don't know what objects they think are important. Um, I need to learn an, a detector for this thing that, that I can't, I don't have right now, but, but they, they clearly think it's important, so I should, mm -hmm. you know, I should do that. Um, but we're not there yet, and we do work with cognitive scientists, so like um, Beth Phillips was a postdoc in TLPS in our cognitive science group and has consulted with us on uh, 
the language papers and written number of papers with us um, about augmented and, and virtual reality. So I, I think that's important, um, especially when we talk about what assumptions we're going to put in versus learning. Uh, but we, but we're just in teams or teaming. I'm just not there yet. Like I, I don't feel my robot. I don't understand enough about how to do it with one person to want to add more people yet.